Delighted that you're here this morning. We have a good number present. We appreciate the presence of everyone. I encourage you to be getting your Bible open to Genesis 37 as our starting place, Genesis chapter 37. This is the story of Joseph. Introduced to Joseph as a young man, 17 years of age, here in this context. Joseph's brothers did not treat him as they should. That's obviously an understatement as you go through this story. But in chapter 37 and in verse 4, they were envious of him, the text says. And the text doesn't use the word envy, but because his father favored him over the others, they were envious of him, as the text obviously shows. We drop down to verse 18 now. They wanted to kill him. When he goes out to greet them into the field, as his father had sent him, out where the flocks were, they saw him coming and said, Is not this the dreamer? And notice at verse 18, they conspired against him to kill him. They wanted to kill him. And they even said, Here's our game plan. If I might paraphrase verse 20, we'll cast him in the pit. We're going to kill him. And we'll say some wild animal devoured him. That's what we want to do with our brother. We drop down to verse 24 of the same context. What they ended up doing instead of killing him was cast him into a pit and left him there for just a little bit. Then some Ishmaelite traders came by and they saw them and they said, here's a good idea, let's just sell him and get rid of him. And so they sold him to this Midianite traders and he went off then and went into Egypt as you well know the story. But let's back up just a little bit now. And I want us to look at Reuben's... Um, play in this story, beginning at verse 21, it was Reuben who, when he heard it, he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. It was his idea, let's put him in the pit, and the idea of putting him in the pit was, he was going to come back and rescue him and take him back to his father. But he reasoned with his brothers, saying to his brothers, that what we need to do is let's not kill him, and we'll see more about that here in just a moment. But I want you to notice now, let's skip ahead now to chapter 42. So you're at chapter 37, jump over a few chapters. In the meantime, before we get to chapter 42, what has happened is that Joseph has risen in power, and now he's a prominent man down in Egypt. His brothers come before him in Egypt now. They don't know that this is their brother. He recognizes them, but they don't know him just yet. Joseph tested them according to chapter 42, beginning at verse 15, and accused them of being spies. He knew they weren't spies, but he wants to put them to the test. And since you say you're not spies, and you're telling me about your father, and you're telling me about a brother that's left back at home, your youngest brother, I want you to go back and get your brother and bring him here, and I'm going to keep one of you here in prison to make sure you're going to come back. And so he puts them to the test. And I want you to now notice now at verse 40, uh, verse 21, they begin to reason among themselves. Genesis 42, verse 21, they begin to reason among themselves. We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when we pleaded with, when he, when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear, therefore this distress has come upon us. We're now in trouble. We're now beginning to pay a price for what we did to our brother back then. Notice now verse 22, here's the key to our text and for our study this morning. Reuben answered and said, and I'm going to paraphrase, I warned you, I told you. Don't you remember me talking to you? I told you, did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? Didn't I tell you that? Don't you remember me talking to you when, when y'all were wanting to kill him? I reasoned with you and I warned you. I told you, do not sin against the boy. The King James and the American Standard translate that, do not sin against the child. Did I not tell you, do not sin against the child? He warned and they were warned and yet they ignored the warning. You might underline that phrase in your Bible. Let's talk about that phrase for a little while. Do not sin against the child. Reuben said, I told you and I warned you, do not sin against the child. You wouldn't listen to me. And I want to suggest to you that it's possible, altogether possible, we could sin against the child today. That might come in some action toward the child, something we do to the child. 
more often than not, it may come in the form of neglect. We may sin against the child in neglecting to do something for the child and our rearing and our training of the child. It very well may take years to see the effect. Galatians 6 talks about we reap what we sow. It might be I neglect the child somehow, and I don't really realize what I'm neglecting, and years pass by, and now I'm beginning to reap what I've been sowing all of those years, and now I'm beginning to see the effect of that. In fact, it may be that later we regret the sin and we shed tears. Don't you think these boys are kind of concerned now? As they say, you know, there's, this thing has befallen us and we've got to leave one behind and he's sending us home and we don't know what he's going to do with the one we leave behind. And it's all because of what we did to our brother. But we're now facing the consequence of all of that. In fact, in fact, the point of the text is the question that is being raised by Reuben reflects some fear. Didn't I tell you? We're now facing the consequences of the sin. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the child? I told you about that. And now look what's happening to us. We're seeing being sent back home with our grain and leaving one of our brothers behind. One that we didn't want to leave. Do not sin against the child. I want to suggest to you that applies far beyond the parents. Obviously, the first application is to the parents. Do not sin against the child, and that's where our primary application is going to be in our study this morning. But that would apply to extended family as well. That's going to apply to siblings. You could sin. In this case, in fact, in Genesis 42, he was saying, you brothers, we brothers, we sinned against the child. Wasn't the parents, it was the brothers that sinned against the child. It might be a friend that sins against the child. It might be someone who doesn't even have children could sin against the child. It might be the church as a whole could sin against the child by the things that we say or we do or we neglect. So let's talk this morning about do not sin against the child. Do not sin against the child. There are a number of ways in which we may do that. And again, our primary focus is on the parents, though it extends well beyond that. How could it be that we sin against the child? How could that happen? Well, one of the ways in which we could do that is by not providing a loving family relationship. We could sin against the child by not providing a loving family relationship. Now, I want to suggest to you that the biblical ideal is for there to be a complete loving family. That's the ideal. Now, I recognize not everyone is in that ideal. And we can give biblical examples of that. That they're not all in that biblical ideal. But here's the biblical ideal. The, the biblical concept of the ideal family circumstance is to have a father and mother and children. You say, how do you know that? Well, in 1 Timothy 5.13, Paul said, I would that younger widows marry and bear children. They get married, now we have a father and mother and bear children, now we have children. We have a father and mother and children. So that's the ideal for a complete family unit. Now, not everyone has that, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Furthermore, for there to be love in the family. Numerous passages would imply love, but let's just take one. The older women should teach the younger women to love their husbands and to love their children. If they have to teach the younger widows how to do that, or younger women how to do that, that suggests there's a great deal involved in loving the children. So from that, I'm learning the principle, here is a loving family relationship. But I want to suggest to you that all too often, there is not a loving family relationship. And so we bring children into the world, we raise those children in an environment that is not a loving family relationship. How so? Sometimes we have children and then we don't have time for the children. We have very little time to devote to the children. We don't have time to answer their questions. We don't have time to solve their difficulties. We don't have time to play games with them or play dolls with them or pitch the ball for them because we're too busy in life's affairs. We're too busy with our jobs. We're too busy looking at our phones. We're too busy at engaging in our hobbies. Whatever it may be, we're too busy doing things to spend time with the child. Do not sin against the child. 
There was a survey taken a number of years ago of some 1,500 children, and they were asked this question, what do you think makes a happy family? The number one answer was doing things together. It wasn't having a lot of money. It wasn't having a lot of toys. It wasn't being given a great deal by your parents, but doing things together. Are you spending time with your children? Do you have time to answer their questions? Do you have time to solve their difficulties? Do you have time to do things that they want to do that may not be of great moment of yours? Do you have time for your children? Graduate students at the University of Chicago were asked what gave them their major ideas on morals and religion. And they replied through conversation in family at mealtime. Do you have time to sit together as a family at a meal and with the TV off, without your phones, so that you can devote some conversation with your children and engage in some discussion where they might learn principles of morality and principles of family and principles of religion? Besides just what we might learn at church or learn in Bible class. How could it be that I'm sinning against the child? It may be I don't have time for the children. Or it may be there's marital strain that the children see and they know. It doesn't take a, a real smart child to figure out mom and dad aren't getting along, I don't think. There's marital strain in this relationship. They're arguing and they're fussing and they're pulling apart. And they seem to be tense. And, and there seems to be a marital strain going on in this relationship. The children see it and they know it and they feel it and they understand it and they may think they're to blame for it. Children deserve a family relationship that's a loving family relationship. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 19. Sometimes the strain becomes so great that it ends in divorce. Here's what Jesus said about divorce when asked, can a man divorce his wife just for any reason? And Jesus answered that, Matthew 19 and in verse 4, beginning by saying, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? Wherefore they are no longer two but one flesh. What God is joined together let not man separate. Without giving the details, Jesus gave four reasons why you can't divorce just for any reason. The question was, can we just get into marriage circumstance and then end it at our will and decide when we're having troubles, we can just call it ends and we will have a divorce. And Jesus said, no, 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 you can't do that. Divorce is wrong. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul answered the same question in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There must have been some questions directed to Paul that he's responding to here in 1 Corinthians. Now concerning the things wherever you wrote to me, he said in chapter 7 and in verse 1. Now one of those questions must be, shall, can, should we continue in the marriage relationship or could we end that marriage relationship? And so he says, beginning at verse 10, to the married, I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. Paul, what do you mean by depart? I mean exactly what I mean in verse 12, or verse 11, what I call divorce. In other words, back to verse 10, a wife is not to divorce her husband. But and if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and the husband is not to depart from his wife. The husband's not to divorce, the wife is not to divorce. So Paul is saying the same thing that, the, that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19. But here's what I'm learning from that. Divorce is wrong. Divorce is dangerous. Divorce is disastrous. But all too often you have a, do not have a loving family relationship because dad leaves mom or mom leaves dad. They end in divorce and now ma the child is raised without the daddy living with them or maybe the mom is not living with them. Or they spend part of the time with the mom and part of the time with the dad and the family is torn asunder because of divorce. Some are raised in a miserable home life. Oh, they don't have a divorce. We wouldn't think of divorce because we believe in the principle of keeping the marriage together. But there's a miserable home life because it's a dysfunctional family. There's constant criticism being offered to the children and to the wife and to the husband. And sometimes back to the parents. A home filled with anger. 
where the children hear hollering at mom, they hear hollering at dad, and they get yelled at themselves. What a miserable home life. Do not sin against the child. How could we do that? By not providing a loving family relationship. Let me ask you, are you providing a loving family relationship in your home? Can your children say, you know what, I had a loving family. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a loving family relationship. There wasn't hollering. There wasn't screaming. There wasn't marital strain. There was no talk of divorce. Mom and dad had time for us. We loved and we had a loving family relationship. Do not sin against the child, Reuben said. I told you about that. Told you not to sin against him. How could we today sin against the child? One of the things we could do is by not administering corrective discipline. We can sin against the child, but not administering corrective discipline. Let's go to the book of Proverbs this time. The book of Proverbs is filled with expressions that tell us about raising and the rearing of children. I know of no book that helped me anymore as a young parent than studying and restudying and restudying the book of Proverbs. Let's go to the 19th chapter and in verse 18. Proverbs 19 and in verse 18. Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. Or do not spare, the King James says, for his crying. What I'm learning from this is, you began early. Go back to the verse, verse 19, verse 18 rather. <clears throat> Chasten your son while there's hope. While you can still mold and you can still shape and you can make some changes in their life. So you begin early with corrective discipline. Let's look at another passage, the 13th division and in verse 24. It should be driven by love. Any corrective discipline should not be driven out of anger. Because you upset me, you made me mad, I am now going to spank the child out of anger, but it should be driven because of love. Notice chapter 13 and in verse 24. He that spares the rod hates his son, but he that loves him disciplines him promptly. Now keep your Bible open there, we're going to come back to that verse in a moment. But I'm learning from that it's driven out of love. Same verse now, we should act promptly. I'm reading for the New King James, and the New King James says at verse 24, He that loves him disciplines him promptly. If you have marginal notes, you might look at your marginal note, and it may use the word early. What does it mean he disciplines him promptly? Well, this is from Strong's, and Strong says that this word, and I'm not going to read the entire quotation here, comes from a primitive root, which means properly to, to dawn, or to be up early at a task, or by implication, by extension, the search for with painstaking. In the King James, to do something betimes or, or to rise early. It's the same concept of you rising early to get to your task. You don't wait later in the day to get to your task, but you rise early to get to your task. You're doing it promptly. Same concept, same idea. And let's look at some other translations. That he hastens, uh, hastened him chastisement, hath hastened him chastisement. Young's literal, that's kind of uh, wooden, but it gives the idea of he works at it very early. He chastens him early, the modern King James. He disciplines him diligently, the New American Standard. But I'm interested in Callan Dalich here. Callan Dalich is a commentator, I recognize, but they spend a great deal of time and emphasis on the meaning of the Hebrew words. And notice what they have to say. He does not denote the early morning of the day. That's not what he's talking about, but the morning of life. That when you discipline him early, as in rising early in the morning, he's talking about in the early morning of the life of the child, starting early. That's the idea. You don't wait till they get, get some age on them. And then notice he said a father who truly wishes his son uh, to keep him be times under strict discipline, to give him while he is yet capable of being influenced in the right direction and to allow no errors to root themselves in him. You haven't given time for other things to take root in the child. You're starting early. But he who is indulgent toward the child, when he ought to be strict, act as if he wishes his ruin. So if you wait till the child comes along and say, well, I'm going to wait till he gets on up mature, and, and then I'm going to begin to shape and mold him. You're wishing his ruin. 
You start early while you can mold and you can shape the child. Let's go further in Proverbs 22 now and in verse 15. The design of the corrective discipline should be to correct the behavior. Again, not because I'm angry and I want to take it out on you and I want you to know that I'm angry with you, but it's the idea of correcting the behavior. Notice Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod... Now let's footnote here. What is the rod? Now if I talk about a rod, you probably think of a big stick something or maybe a metal rod. The rod is a branch or a stick or it's the idea of a shoot or what we would think of as a switch. They're going to switch to the child. Spanking the child. Now let's go back to our text. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the spanking or the rod of correction will drive it far from him. It corrects the misbehavior. Paraphrase, the verse is saying children will misbehave. The correction will correct that misbehavior. But let's go further. Let's look at Proverbs 23. The correction of the child should have the future of the child in mind. That is, as we're correcting the child, we should not only think of the immediate moment, I want to correct this misbehavior. The child is being sassy, I want to correct that because I don't want him to be sassy. The the child is being dishonest, and so I want to correct that because I don't want him lying to me as a young child. I need to have the future in mind. Look at Proverbs 22, or 23 rather, verse 13 and 14. Do not withhold correction from the child. Okay, that's good. Why? Why? For if you beat him with the rod, he will not die, and that's not going to hurt him any. Verse 14, if you beat him with the rod, that's the spanking, and, and deliver his soul from Hades or from hell. In other words, you're, you have the future in mind of what you're going to accomplish, of what you're going to do, what they're going to be as an older child or as an adult. You have the future in mind. Let's go to one more passage along that line, and then we'll go to another point. Hebrews chapter 11, if you will, or chapter 12 and verse 11. Though he's not talking in context about discipline and chastening of the child, he uses the discipline of a child as an illustration. So what's his point? Look at verse verse. Verse 11, no chastening is joyful for the present, but grievous. Nevertheless, here's our word, afterward. Afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness. He just talked about how our fathers chastened us. So when the the father chastens the child, it's not pleasant for anybody. But afterwards, the future is in mind, there is a change. Let me ask you this question. Are you applying corrective discipline? Are you sinning against the child? If Reuben were here, could he say, I told you, I warned you, do not sin against the child. Are you sinning against the child? Are you applying corrective discipline? Do not sin against the child. How could that be done? Thirdly, may I suggest you by not being a good example before the child. That might be the parents, that could be the grandparents, could be siblings. That could be other members of the church setting poor examples that disheartens the child. But let's begin by noticing that children learn from what the parents do. Matthew chapter 5, without going in detail, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, Where Jesus talks about the power of an example in Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. You're the salt of the earth, the light of the world, and how men see your good works and glorify God. That's enough to illustrate our point that examples are powerful. Jesus in that context is saying, concerning the kingdom of God, the way you live can attract other people to the kingdom. They may become Christians based on what they see in you. Examples are powerful. All right, let's go further. Timothy learned from his mother and from his grandmother. It wasn't from his dad. Nothing is said about that. About his dad being a great influence upon him. But his mother and his grandmother, the text tells us. Their example of their devotion and their godliness and their instruction is what led Timothy to be what he was. May I suggest to you that kings often learn from their dads. Let's go back to the kings for a moment. Let's give a bad example and a good example. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 22. 
You, you remember from your study of the Kings, this is just a sampling of that, in 1 Kings chapter 22, that I want you to notice in chapter 22 that Jehoshaphat learned from his father Asa. 1 Kings chapter 22 beginning at verse 43, that he walked in all the ways of his father Asa and did not turn aside from doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Here's a good example. In other words, Asa was a good king. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Jehoshaphat was a good king in the south. And he learned from the ways of his father. His father was a powerful example to him is what I'm learning from that. All right, let's go to another example. Let's, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 22, same chapter, over about verse 51 and 52. Ahaziah learned from Ahab. Now, Ahab obviously was a wicked man, but I want you to notice... That at verse 52, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father and in the ways of his mother and the ways of Jeroboam who had made Israel to sin. All I'm trying to illustrate is many times there would be a good king who had a good son. Where'd the son learn that from? His daddy. There would be a bad evil king like Ahab and his son would learn his ways. Where'd he learn it? Learn from his daddy. We're trying to illustrate that children often learn from their parents. After all, it's true that actions speak louder than words. In other words, we can tell our children, here's what you need to be. Here's what I want you to become. Here's what I, how I want you to behave. But they're going to be watching exactly what the parents are doing and they're going to imitate what they see. Now, many children of Christians see the following. No matter what the parents may say, here's what they often see. They see things that hinder the service. Now they may hear preaching and teaching and Bible class teaching, and even the parents say, the Lord is first in our life. Don't ever forget that. Children sometimes are raised by Christians, and what those children are seeing are things that hinder our service. That, that we would under most circumstances, but we've had some things hinder our service. There's just times we just don't do what the Lord would have us to do. They may see parents who miss services in order to travel or to visit. You see, we, we want to go see some family. We want to go on vacation. And there's not a church in that area. So we just won't go to church today because we're on vacation. We're headed to have some fun. And so we're going to miss church today for that. And children are learning from that example. Children may see, you know, work sometimes seems to be more important than spiritual because that causes me to miss services, mom and dad to miss services. And when I wanted a job, they said that I could miss services in order to work. So what I'm learning from that, maybe job is more important than worship and service to the Lord. That may be what they're learning from the example. It may be they see very little example of discussion about the importance of spiritual matters. Maybe around the family table, if we even have a family table discussion around supper, it may center around sports. It may center around money. It may center around education and schooling. And there may be very little discussion of spiritual matters. How sad it would be for a child to grow up and think, you know what, I never heard much discussion about spiritual things in our home. They may see hypocrisy. They see daddy saying one thing, but he does quite different. Mama tells me I need to, but then she doesn't do that herself. They may see anger and wrath and outbursts. They may see family troubles and marital strain that they're seeing in their parents and they learn that's normal. And that's how I'm going to conduct my marriage as well, they may think. Let's go back to the book of Proverbs, if you will. Proverbs 20. We shouldn't be surprised at all. When children are raised by families that don't set a good example, the children turn out to be just like their parents. Look at Proverbs 20 and verse 7. The righteous man walks in his integrity. Paraphrase, a good man does good things. His children are blessed after him. I'm not surprised when that kind of man has children that turn out to be just like him. Big surprise. Ezekiel 16.44 is a proverb that says, like mother, like daughter. Big surprise. She turned out to be just like her mother. 
he turned out to be just like his daddy. You see, when you have parents that are spiritually weak, don't be surprised when your children turn out to be spiritually weak just like them. You go to about a fourth of the services, don't be surprised when your children go to about an eighth of the services or less. Don't be surprised. They'll turn out to be just like you. You see, when parents are strong, don't be surprised. That's not a big, you sure were lucky your children turned out well. Don't be surprised. When parents are strong, the children turn out that way. Big surprise. Don't be surprised when you see parents where their family struggles, that the children have family struggles, where they don't know how to get along with their mate. When they see mom and dad couldn't get along, then when they get married, they think this is normal. This is the way everybody is. We just argue and fuss and fight and may end in divorce. When parents have apathy and have very little spiritual interest, don't be surprised when children turn out to be just the same way. Do not sin against the child, Reuben said. Are you setting a great example before your children? What are you showing them? What are you instructing them? What are you teaching them? Reuben said, do not sin against the child. How could I do that today? I can sin against the child by not teaching him the word. I can sin against the child by not teaching him the word. I want to suggest to you, starting in Proverbs chapter 22 and in verse 6, that parents are to teach their children the way of the Lord. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train a child in the way that he should go. That would include the instruction of the word. Ephesians chapter 6, fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Bring them up in the training of the Lord, in the discipline of the Lord. And fathers are responsible for that. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's turn back there just for a moment, where Moses in his second sermon of those four sermons that he had. I want you to notice in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that after instilling in the parents at verse 6 that these you take the command, these words that I command you shall be in your heart. In other words, you saturate your own mind and your own heart with the word. Here's what you do next. You shall teach them diligently to your children. The idea of diligent is sending it thin to them like a sharp instrument. It's the idea of wedding or being sharp. And so you insert that into their minds. You teach them diligently to your children. Teaching them the word. We won't take the time to return because we've already alluded to 2 Timothy 1, 5 and 3, 15. That's exactly what Timothy's mother and grandmother did with him. They took the scriptures that from a childhood you've known the Holy Scriptures. How did he know it from childhood? Because his mother and his grandmother were teaching him the scriptures. I'm learning from that that parents are to teach their children the word. The responsibility does not lie. If it relies upon the parents, it doesn't rely upon the church. In other words, as I bring a child into the world and I'm trying to raise this child, the responsibility for teaching that child the word is not laid upon the church. If they don't know the word, it's the church's fault. Nor is it the Bible class teacher, nor is it the elders, nor is it the preacher. There are responsibilities the church has, the elders have, the preacher has, the the church has, the Bible class teacher has. But what if there wasn't a Bible class teacher? What if there wasn't any elders? What if it was a poor preacher? You still have the responsibility to rear and to raise your child to know the will of God. And I want to suggest to you that that doesn't require modern tools or a great class program. I'm all for having a great Bible class program where we teach our children. There are a number of churches that don't even have Bible classes, and yet children could be raised in an environment and know their Bibles and know it well. You say, how do you know? How do you know? Because God placed that upon the parents. God placed that squarely upon your shoulders. The children of Israel could do it, and they didn't have computers. The children of Israel could do it, and there's no indication they had modern Bible class arrangements. You take it and you saturate your heart, and then you teach it diligently to your children. Israel was expected to do that without modern tools. I want to tell you, Lois and Eunice did it. And they didn't have access to a computer with a Bible program where they could quickly access all the information they could get a hold of, and so the child could easily learn the Scriptures. They took the scrolls and they taught Timothy the scriptures. 
And I want us to go to Genesis chapter 18 and I want to share with you that Abraham could and did do that. God said, I've commanded Abraham. And what's Abraham now to do? Look at Genesis chapter 18, if you will, and in verse 19. Genesis chapter 18 and in verse 19, I've ordered him and commanded him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. That they may keep the ways of the Lord and do righteousness and justice. Abraham, Abraham didn't have the modern tools. And I'm suggesting it's within our capability and within our hands. Here's some things children need to be taught. They need to be taught right from wrong. What, what am I going to teach them when I sit down? Well, I might need to teach them about morals. Galatians 5 talks about things that are the works of the flesh. I may to teach them about what is immoral. I may to teach them about drinking. I may to teach them about smoking. I may need to teach them about uh, modesty. I may need to teach my children about the dangers of worldliness. Teach them about morals. Teach them about the evils of divorce. I may need to teach my children the truth from error. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is error and this is truth. Here is the standard, and I know this is to be right, and I know this to be wrong, and I need to teach him what's right from wrong. Don't let them learn it for themselves. Let them figure it out for themselves. Teach him the difference in truth and error. I may need to teach my children good judgment based upon the will of God, Colossians 1 and verse 19. This is good judgment. This is extremely poor judgment. I may need to teach my children what the text means in its context. That's the argument of Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, by the way. That I may need to teach them the text. Not just principles about the text. But here is what this verse means in its context. I may need to teach that to my children. I may need to teach my children work ethic. And how that's a biblical principle of work ethic. That we ought to work. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 23. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossians. And he's not talking about working in the kingdom as such. But as a laborer or even as a servant. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. You may be serving man, but work like you're working for the Lord. That's a good work ethic. I want to tell you, there's a lot of young people that don't have any principles of work ethic. And it may be because not we failed as a church, but because we failed as parents to teach our children a work ethic. We're not teaching them how to work like they're working for the Lord. Well, well, here's something else I might need to teach. Teach them how to pray. You see, we need to be taught... The disciples said, teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. We need to teach that to our children. Let me ask you, are you teaching your child the word? Are you depending on the Bible class teachers to get that job done? The Bible class program to get that done? Hearing in the pulpit to get that done? Or are you trying to teach your children the word of God? Do not sin against the child. How could I do that? By not preparing him for challenges he faces. What a disservice to the child. You see, the parent needs to warn children of dangers of head. See, that's part of bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, isn't it? Or bring them up in the way of the Lord. And here's something that may lead you away from that. That's part of training them in the way they should go. And by the way, a watchman warns. Paul said, I did not cease to warn you night and day with tears. Ezekiel was a watchman and God told him, you warn the people. What if they don't listen? You warn them anyway. That's what a watchman does. He warns. We must prepare our children for the challenges that are ahead. Don't sin against the child and make sure that you, you warn them what they're going to face in school. Nothing wrong with sending your child to public school, but when they go off to public school, you warn them about evolution, that they're going to hear about that. That may destroy their faith. They may get a good dose in school and on television and in some of the books they read about moral relativism, which simply says there is no common standard. Truth is what you want it to be. Let me get a good dose of that. Warn them about that. Tell them about that. Watch for that. We must prepare them for the challenge of college. There may be attacks on their faith. And because I happen to know who may be there, or I may know some of the people that have gone to school there, or I may know some of the professors, that doesn't mean there won't be attacks on their faith. Prepare them for that. 
Warn them about loose thinking and laxness among brethren. I think we have a concept among non-institutional churches, among brethren, that, that I want to go find a church, and as long as it's a church of Christ, then my children are safe to go there. But if you're a little ahead of the game, some think that, well, I tell you what, I found out it's a non-institutional church. They don't believe in institutionalism. My child is safe in going there, and that's not always the case. They may be loose on divorce and remarriage. They may be loose on morals. They may be loose on fellowship. They may be accepting of things that they don't refute. They're not teaching error, but they don't deal with error either. Just because it's a non-institutional church doesn't mean it's the great place for your children to go. They get out on their own and they begin to go one place and then another and place membership. Warn them about the looseness among churches of Christ, among non-institutional churches of Christ. You warn them about that. Prepare them for the challenges that are ahead. Warn them about the dangers of some careers. Nothing wrong with this career within itself, but that could be a career that's going to keep you away from the Lord a good bit, that causes you to miss a lot of services, or puts you in a company of people that's going to be dangerous to your soul. Nothing wrong with the career within itself, but warn them about some careers before they choose them. Let me ask you a question. Are you preparing your child for the challenges they face ahead? One more time, let's raise the question. What is it that I might be doing that I could sin against the child? What could I be guilty of? By not watching carefully. By not watching carefully. Parents need to be watchful and they need to be careful. Let's go back to Deuteronomy one more time. This was in the first sermon of, of Moses. In the book of Deuteronomy. In the fourth division, in chapter... Four here and verse 9 and 10. This is part of teaching them to fear God. This is part of teaching them to fear God. Notice he said, Only take heed to yourselves and diligently keep yourselves, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and to your grandchildren. Now look at verse 10. Dropping down toward the end of the verse. That they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth and they may teach their children. Teach your children so well to fear the Lord that they know it well enough they're going to teach it to your grandchildren for you. That's part of teaching them to fear God. If you're watchful and you're careful, what is in conflict with the fear of God? You know, Eli was not so watchful of his children. You remember his sons were given to wickedness, they were corrupt. Chapter 2 verse 12 says... Chapter 3 and verse 13 says he did not restrain them. He didn't watch them too closely. Paul says we're to walk circumspectly. And if I want my children to walk circumspectly, very carefully, making the wise choice after wise choice, then I want to be watchful and I want to be careful. Parents need to be careful and they need to watch who your children's friends are. They don't watch who their friends are. Don't wait until they've got a thick relationship with the child in grade school, and then by the time they get to high school, now in college, they're really thick, and now you warn them, that's really not a good friend for you. It's a little late. It's over. It's too late. Your warning's useless now. You start watching in the early days of who their friends are. Let's go to Proverbs again. Well, just notice one of these saplings. Let's look, notice Proverbs 12 and verse 26. We could compound the references, but this will be enough. The righteous should choose his friends carefully. You should help your children choose their friends carefully. Teach them how to choose their friends carefully. Why? For the way of the wicked leads them astray. Watch who their friends are. The thinking of those friends. What their principles are. What their morals are. And in addition to that, watch who's influencing them. You say, well, you're talking about friends. No, I'm not just talking about their friends. Who's influencing your children? Who in the church could be influencing your children? Not everybody in the church do I want influencing my children and grandchildren. I won't tell you. Not everybody who's in the church do I want influencing my children and grandchildren. Because they have strange ideas sometimes. They have loose ideas sometimes. 
They're not grounded well sometimes. Watch who's talking to your children. Watching who's influencing them. Who are they listening to? Who are they attuned to? Who do they look up to? Who's influencing them? By the way, this is in the context. 1 Corinthians 15, evil communications corrupts good matters. I wasn't talking about friends. That's talking about false teachers. That's talking about false teachers. Running with the wrong crowd, spending time with the wrong person could lead them astray. Watch who's influencing your children. What's the music they hear? What are the lyrics about? What's the message of the song? What's the entertainment they watch on TV, the movies? Watch where they go. The crowd they're with. Let me ask you something. Are you watching carefully with your children? Reuben must have been really upset when he raised the question early on in chapter 37. Don't kill the child. Don't kill him. Don't do any harm to the child. But I think he's shaking in his boots over in chapter 42 when he said, did I not tell you? Did I not warn you? Do not sin against the child. If you're a young parent, this ought to awaken us to be diligent to make sure we raise our children properly. If this scares you a little bit, not near as much as it will when your children are grown and you look back and you say, you know what? I should have paid attention. Do not sin against the child. That'll really scare you. That'll really scare you. How can I sin against the child? By not providing a loving family relationship. By not administering corrective discipline. By not being a good example. Not teaching them the word. Not preparing them for challenges. And not watching carefully. Do not sin against the child. There may be one or more present who's not a Christian, who's not a child of God. Would you come this morning believing Jesus to be the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of your sins, acknowledge your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins? If you're subject in any way, would you come while together we stand and while we sing?